So um, my name is Angad, and I'm on the performance engineering team at Causal. And you can think of Causal as a spreadsheet, but like really, really big, right? So the, it's the thousand x spreadsheet because you know hundreds of teams all over the world use Causal to you know model their businesses, create you know revenue projections, profit and loss models, headcount models, basically anything numerical in nature. Causal as a spreadsheet is, is a great fit for, right? And you know this is a a pretty special presentation for us because this is the first time we're actually unveiling the stuff that we've been working on day in and day out um, at the company for the last year and a half or so. Um, so to give you, give you a better understanding of the, some of the performance challenges around the product, I'm going to very quickly run through what the product looks and feels like. Um, and I'm going to do this by building a simple um, phone app business model using the spreadsheet. So I'm going to go ahead and create, you know, I'm going to price this, you know, example mobile application, say about five quid, and uh, assume a user growth rate month on month of 5% to 10%. And Causal is pretty good at handling uncertainty like this in your, in your models. I can go ahead and now say, you know, users will grow every month by, you know, one plus growth rate. And now I'm interested in segmenting this growth by iPhone and Android, right? So I add a category, and I see that initial, as soon as I add that initial number, you'll see that Causal is extrapolating that time series using my growth rate, correct? Now revenue is simply users times price, nothing too fancy there. But you'll notice that the spreadsheet's now smart enough to detect that, you know, if I have iOS and Android for my user growth, I will also have that breakdown for revenue. And Causal is pretty good at visualizing that stuff. So if I just drag and drop my you know, revenue series, I get a, a nice time chart. I can you know, rename that. And now say I'm interested in splitting iOS and Android you know, further down by US, UK, and EU. I just add another category. And, and you'll notice that this, in a sense, increases the dimensionality of, um, of the data. right? So as soon as I customize some numbers there, right, you'll see revenue. Um, reflected, drilling down to US and UK as well. And on your right-hand side, you'll be seeing a, a three-dimensional, right? There's um, region, platform, and time. Correct? So that's the, that's the product. That's basically causal in action. And you know, you've probably already figured out what we're dealing with here. This is the, the core crux of the engineering challenge when it comes to this calculation engine, is it's really, really easy to like blow these spreadsheets out of size, right? And you know, this, this, is a, this is a way to derive a million cells with just 10 variables. Let me tell you, pretty much every business model on Causal requires a heck of a lot more than just 10 variables to express that, that business, right? So typically, you'll see spreadsheets that go into hundreds of millions of cells on Causal today. And exacerbating this is you know, the sort of breakneck pace that we've had to keep at Causal in terms of you know, constantly innovating on the performance of this engine. So you know, hundreds of teams, you know, de like probably dozens of use cases that come up every couple of months, um, and you know, the the discovery of a new non-trivial use case means engineering has to just constantly pay, play catch up and come up with orders of magnitude in terms of solutions um, versus just incremental engineering. So, how did this spreadsheet sort of come to being? Right, the the first version was you know, very naively implemented right in the browser. So what Causal would do is take your expressions, you know, make the simple compute on you know, Chrome or Safari, and just show your results. And that got us to about 50,000 cells. So you know, most of our early startup customers were very happy with stuff like that. Um, next step was moving this to our backend, because we figured you know, it's time to start doing some more serious computation. And when we moved that stuff to, to the backend, you know, we picked Node.js as our, as our platform of choice. And, and why we did this, I'll, I'll, I'll dive into slightly more now. So the, the real sort of, I think, principle at play here was, was you know, Jeff Atwood's quote that anything that can be written in JavaScript eventually will be written in JavaScript, right? And the, the real reason we, we picked Node.js was more than a conscious choice. It was like, you know, hey, we've got all these nice types and abstractions um, that we're using in the front end code. And all we do is like, create you know, some sort of reusable um, you know, interface there, and we can start you know, building our backend code fairly fine. And, and Node.js is, 
is phenomenal because you know if you look at Atwood's law and, and, and the, in the sort of origins of Atwood's law, it talks about how a language that's less powerful, um, that's that's simpler to think of because it's single-threaded, so on and so forth, will you know fit uh, a message-driven or an event-driven sort of application very very naturally, and it can run on you know pretty much any device, especially mobile devices. Um, the the challenge that we started to run into was was when you started to throw very heavy computational workloads at Node.js it really started to show its single-threaded nature, right? And a large, a large manifestation of that was in the main event loop just being blocked. You know, just sort of a, a stop the world problem, if you may. And, and, and if any of you sort of, out of curiosity, how many of you have run into something like this before on, on, a, on a JavaScript service? You have, perfect. And you know, so it's an interesting problem, and, 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 and what you do when you, when you get into a situation like this is you, you know, do these async hooks and stuff to, to figure out which of these uh, which of these functions are, are sort of worth optimizing? But it's a lot of hard work. Um, we tried switching to workers to sort of distribute these workloads, you know, across multiple cores. Um, but then it comes into you know the, the penalties of having to serialize you know input data and output data. And in terms of causal uh, spreadsheets, you will see that you know there's hundreds of millions of numbers, an equally proportional amount of data that you have to serialize in and out of these workers. Um, another sort of a situation that makes this worse, I would say, is that the, the JavaScript runtime almost entirely controls what it's going to do for pre-allocation, right? So the interesting thing with JS is you can go ahead and say array of 100 or array of 2,000 or whatever, but it's completely up to the runtime to figure out whether it actually wants to pre-allocate that or not. Like the JS spec doesn't necessarily say, um, you know, you have to have that uh, pre-allocated um, memory ready to, ready to use. So my, 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 in essence, what I'm trying to say is, I think, you know, we've made great strides, um, but the, for a performance-critical application like this, the question is really how much do you want to rely on the, on the whims and fancies of, of the runtime versus how much do you want to really control in, in application space? And that was, the, that was the real reason we used Go, right? So m the last few years of my career, I would say, is like I've been primarily driven by Golang. Uh, you know, prior to this, I was, I was scaling this... Um, uh, voice automation um, platform in Go, where we were streaming, you know, uh, millions of, uh, I want to say, phone calls um, on, a, on a daily basis on a telephony stack that was written entirely in GoLang. And my, my pitch for Go um, to Lucas, you know, who's, who's with us in the room today, um, who was the CTO at Causal, was, let me just do a line-by-line -line dump port of, of this entire code base in GoLang, and it's going to be, you know, at least twice to maybe 10 times faster. Like, all I'm going to do is just port my code, make sure all the arrays are pre-allocated and it's stuff like that. And the other observation I made here is that if you'll notice this spreadsheet, you've got this very nice sort of dependency tree of variables that are created, right? So you've, you, know, you know exactly which variables you can parallelize, you know which variables need to be computed before you do, you do the math after them, so on and so forth. So I could already see a, a pretty cohesive concurrency model, and I knew that Go would be absolutely delightful to work with for a, for a problem space like that. So we built our first sort of internal proof of concept. We called it Cow, and I'm happy to dive into this offline as to why that name came about. Uh, <laughs> But uh, we got to about half a million cells with the first uh, prototype of cow, and um, you know we were quite happy, uh, and we knew that we, we knew that you know given enough time we could optimize this to, to something even larger, even e even faster. So, like everybody else, you know most of my days looked like this. I would sit with uh, Go tool pprof. I would sit with you know pretty much every profiling tool I could get my hands on at the time, and and, and a quick note here is that. Is, you know, some of you, um, you know, who may not have necessarily worked with the, the Go tool pprof uh, utility before, is, that, is, is a standard sampling-based profiler, right? Is that what it's going to do? It's going to sample your your frames, you know, in the application as they run once every few times, and at the end of that collection of the sample, it's going to tell you, um, you know, broad strokes. These are the functions that are taking the most amount of time. Then you go into them and you jump and you fix them line by line, make them faster, right? So. There were a few interesting learnings that, that came along um, due to sampling-based profiling. Um, the first was, you know, as you'd notice, we had these cell structs that were you know, presented for you on that spreadsheet. Most of them used like, the same expressions. So we traded off, a, a very simple thing we did was we traded off the immutability constraint that Go gave us by simply using indirection there, right? Simple stuff. 
Um, we, we took the cell struct, we also realized that if you're gonna mutate this, we wanna pass it by reference. Don't wanna take that extra mem copy penalty every time it's passed into some sort of a function. Um, extending that to error messages, really, really going crazy now, going into like string generation for IDs, the occasional error message, because just one error message, if it's being, you know, created a, a few, you know, hundreds of thousands of times for every cell, very specifically targeting it, drilling it down, uh, we had to get smart about string generation. So, we, you know, none of the printfs, none of that stuff that even remotely relied on, you know, checking these um, types um, at runtime. Pre-allocated buffers, count every single character that's, you know, that you're gonna need, and sort of use these string buffers, to, uh, string builders to, to sort of make sure your underlying allocations don't have to be resized, right? And the, and the most interesting thing we came up with was, was, was how we were using sync pool. Um, so sync pool, the, the, there's two ways you can re, you know, reuse memory, right? One way to do it is, is you just have one, one identifier and you like repurpose that, correct? But the problem is, given the nature of the evaluation engine, it's kind of recursive in nature. And, and a sync pool is, is, pretty, is a pretty interesting use case for something that's concurrent and recursive and wants to reuse uh, you know, memory allocations. So some fun learnings there. Um, and we got, we got definitely, I would say, about you know, 20, 30% sort of speed bumps doing each of these things. The, the more interesting, probably rarer to come across profiling that we ran was a, was a thing called causal profiling. No connection with the company. Um, so causal profiling is the outcome of academic research and uh, you know, you, you, it's sort of distilled into this uh, profiling tool called cause. And the way cause works, is it asks you the question, um, given that your program is concurrent, given that in the real world it's running on a you know, multi-threaded system, and given that those threads are each competing for some sort of resource at the bottom, right? how do I identify my highest ROI optimizations? So the question cause poses is, what if I could magically speed certain blocks of my code and in the real world see how much that would improve my total runtime by? So in this diagram, for instance, if I could magically speed up F by 15%, and I would know that my overall program is actually impacted by 30 or 40%, I would definitely know it's a better optimization, for, you know, for example, than to make for another function, which isn't being called as much or whatever, right? And, and since it obviously can't magically speed up your code for you, the way it implements this is by doing a virtual speed up. So what something like cause would do is it would actually inject a delay into one of your routines, and it would say, hey, everything else being a constant, everything else in this experiment, all things remaining the same, um, my control tells me that if you go 15% in the opposite direction, chances are equally high that you know, you're gonna get that exact same speed up as you did that slowdown. So um, how did this sort of translate into things that we, we actually did at the code level? I think the most interesting points that cause pointed us towards were to do with memoization. So the functions that were, you know, Kind of, we knew they were complex, we just didn't realize how much of an impact they had on the overall runtime. We simply memoized them, and, and you know, the fact that you have structs as inputs for some of these make it very, very easy to memoize things in Go. And lastly, you know, we, we are finally in Goland, and we, and we definitely want to you know, you know, juice the most of, of the you know, multi-core systems that we're sitting on. So we, we came up with some interesting patterns to sort of help us make our programs concurrent with, with confidence. So the first is probably the most basic you know, lesson that you learn in probably in engineering school, right? Which is, if you're going to use something more often, just like pre-allocate it, get that, um, you know, once you've initiated it once, you have read concurrency, as long as it's you know, completely immutable after it's born, that's fantastic, right? So the, the, sometimes you can't do that, sometimes you do have to use a sync dot once, right? But the, the core learning here is, there's a, a, a non-trivial cost every time you, you write a mutex or, or you know, every time you're using some sort of semaphore somewhere. Um, it's, 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 it's probably, like, I wish I could sometimes create a linter rule for something like this, right? Is to, is to really force the programmer to think, do I absolutely need this? Or is there another paradigm that will allow me to sequence this differently? The, the second bits were more around how we were using channels. Um, the, the channel, abstraction I found was fantastic for, for distributing workloads. So if I had a bunch of tasks and a bunch of Go routines, I would make sure that my Go routines are counted, right? Make sure I have only the right amount of Go routines to get that sort of bell curve, because too many Go routines and I'm you know, spending a lot of overhead managing those Go routines. So I would, I would sort of pre-allocate the number of Go routines we had, distribute them via the channel, and things would be great. But things where I didn't know beforehand how much data I was gonna pump in and out of these channels, 
um, I was very quickly reminded that channels internally use semaphores, right? There is a, there is a first in, first out behavior that channels have, and that, that behavior comes at a, uh, at a severe performance cost. So in places where, where you can come up with a, with a more, uh, I would say, a, a stronger mental model for your concurrency, you are much better suited to sort of paralyzing by something like an error group, where you simply run a bunch of stuff and you wait. You know, if any one thing errors, you stop the other things in the, you know, sort of, you let them run and you return that one error, right? Um, in our case, that mental model was the, was the variable dependency graph that you would see, because it was quite obvious that we would just have to paralyze at that level. And then, you know, later on we started splitting variables and, and making sure that we could paralyze even further. The, the interesting way we used the Go context type was we took the context.context .context type, like the simple context that Go offers, um, and that gave us all the nice things like you know, cancellations, timeouts, stuff like that. What we also did was we started to scope our reused memory allocations in there, um, almost in a way sort of transferring the ownership of that memory at, to the Go routine, right? So what I could do is I could have one Go routine get a context at the top, and that context would get drilled down all the way to the la very last function that that Go routine is ex executing. And that way I knew that two Go routines were never necessarily having any sort of read-write conflicts. Um, this does come at a behavior when you're, tr when you're shifting that ownership of memory. Obviously, you know, a simple pointer dereference, like cell dot something, is, is much faster than if you have to look up the cell ID in another structure. So that ownership has an interesting trade-off to it, and you know, that's one of the fun things you get to do when, when you, when you want to do safe versus speed. Um, I think, finally, Probably the most underrated uh, safety tooling that we did was just running the race detector in CI. Like just saying, go test ra race, have a big enough workload, and make sure your CI is configured to have more than one thread. That's a <laughs> pro tip. <laughs> you want to make sure your CI is running like at least four or five threads. And, and you, can catch, uh, you can catch your read-write um, uh, sort of overlaps very, very targetedly, right? Because you're going to, the, the tooling will alert exactly this is the line where that read and writes are happening. And there was a, there was a great talk about this um, yesterday as well. So that's pretty much you know, everything we did to take us to about 2 million cells. And you know, things were good. Um, as always, you, you build a bigger road, they buy more cars, right? So very soon, we start to see that users on Causal are now hitting the 2 million mark. And now things were a bit stressful because we'd run out of all cheap tricks, right? Uh, we started to look at our profiles, and, and this is what we saw, right? Uh, and, and I would stare at these profiles, hoping something is there that I didn't expect to be there, right? And it seemed all fine to me. And the realization that started to dawn upon us was that, you know, profiles are great when they have some sort of dissonance with your mental model of the application. So if I know deep down inside that more or less this is the stuff an evaluation engine should do, and that this seems about fine. And my profiler you know, says that you know, you're actually spending 20% logging, or you're you know, spending 20% doing some sort of memory allocation you don't need to do. That's great, because I can, I can go and fix that. right? But the problem starts when your profiler and your mental model absolutely align. Because at that point, um, the bottleneck is no longer your engineering ability or your optimization. It's, it's, it's just the mental model. right? And the question really was, this is obviously the local maxima of performance that Causal is at, but where's that larger global maxima? Like, is there, is there a paradigm? And we very, very intuitively, we knew that we could get faster, right? Uh, we, we knew that the amount of compute we were throwing at this, we, we should be an order of magnitude faster. We just didn't know how much and, and how to sort of derive that number. We were very lucky at the time to, to run into Simon S. Kilson. And uh, Simon has worn many hats. He was uh, early at Shopify, uh, sometimes serving as uh, you know, principal engineer and, and other times as director of engineering. And Simon has this um, philosophy of um, napkin math. So he approaches software, um, almost all of these performance problems, um, with baseline um, mathematics. And the way he, I, I'd like to probably use a story Simon, Simon quotes on his blog for this. Um, he talks about the time when you know, Elon Musk decided to get into the rocket-making world. And, and he says, and please fact-check me on this, I'm, I'm not much of a Musk fan myself. Um, he says that Elon Musk Googled the amount of metals that you need to go into a rocket. So he said, how much you know, of metal A, B, C do I need to build a rocket? 
And then he went and Googled the, the spot prices of all of these metals on some sort of a metal exchange, right? And by multiplying those numbers and summing them up, he said, all right, the cheapest possible rocket I can build is you know, X dollars. And compared to that, the, the real cost today of deploying these rockets were at you know, 10,000, 20,000 times that price. Therefore, that's the, that's the sort of area for innovation that, that anybody entering this market has. That's the, that's the surface area I can exploit. And, and when you apply this, this philosophy to software, and when you acknowledge that all software is either bound by CPU, memory, or I.O., you can quickly start to see the power of establishing these baseline models. Right? And Simon does a great job of, of drilling down um, into some of these very quick numbers. He, in fact, highly recommends that you memorize these numbers. Um, and uh, you, know, you can quickly run them at the back of, your, back of your head. So you should definitely give this blog a, a visit. And finally, I think, I think this, was, this, is, this is one of Simon's quotes that I think uh, most resonated with me, which was that profilers were great for you know, 10, 20%, but the, by definition, a sample can never tell you how to get faster than 100%, right? And, and you needed that order of magnitude improvement with a completely different paradigm. The model that we came up with, um, and, and I, want, I want to sort of have a disclaimer here, which is, this model seems awfully simple, and you know, know that it was an absolute journey to getting here. <laughs> I think we, we started with very complex models, and we had to really beat it down into something we could very easily communicate. But uh, broad strokes, the, the sort of realization we came to was um, if, you, if you have a very simple causal model that's adding or subtracting two numbers, and you know, these two variables, for instance, say have a billion numbers each, right? Um, one variable with a billion cells, each number being 64-bit or 8 bytes, gives you 8 gigabytes per variable, right? You have two input variables and one destination variable, so that's you know, 24 gigs of total sort of memory, memory access, right? And going on Simon's blog, you'll see that you know, with SIMD or single instruction multiple data um, on your CPU, um, on, in your program, and with, um, with something like threading, you're expected to get more or less, you know, 30, 30 ms per one gig. That's the sort of memory bandwidth um, bottleneck that you should expect to see. Um, again, these are, these are broad numbers. These numbers change all the time, but the, the point here is to establish that baseline very quickly, right? Um, this tells us that, you know, about 720 ms, or, you know, we said broad strokes, about 700 ms is the absolute fastest you can, you can sum up uh, two very large causal variables. Um, obviously, this was very, very far apart from you know, the numbers we were observing in production. And th there are layers and layers of complexity in causal above this simple operation, right? But what this showed to us very clearly was that there was definitely a lot of fat to trim. And the conversation then started to conclude upon how we were representing these, these spreadsheets. And as dumb as this may sound, at the time, I had gone with the choice of representing the spreadsheet as a hash map. And before you think I'm an absolute idiot, let me defend myself. The, the reason I picked a hash map there was because, first of all, a lot of these variables had empty values. So about, you know, sometimes in some of these large cohort analysis models, you would imagine that about 50% of the cells were empty. So I said, you know, the larger I get, um, the, the, the more I'm going to thank myself for not allocating all these cells I don't want, right? So I wanted to have something that could, that could scale well with those sparse models. And Simon blew that one out of the door. He just said, look, a one-hot vector is sparse, right? 50% uh, is not sparse. He's like, more often than not, if, if your array is like half full, you probably still want an array. You, you don't want a map, right? And the second thing I started to tell him was that, you know, go back to that flame chart, and, and if you look at that flame chart, the, the hashing is taking like less than four or five percent. Now, do you really want me to like rewrite the entire application to use arrays everywhere? Because like it's four or five percent. How much faster is my app going to get because of this? And he says, the real cost of the hash map is random memory access, right? The real cost of the, of the hash map is, is something that will never show up in your flame charts because your, your, your CPU um, cache misses are happening much lower than, than your sampling space and they would just not show up. There are tools now that, that help you profile your, your CPU cache access, but you know, the, 
what we were using and heavy, heavily relying on, those tools just didn't show us any of those things at all. And, and, and this was a whole new world for me. I've, I've you know, programmed all my life, but I've you know, many layers of abstraction over, over the underlying CPU. Never had to really think about these things. And, and the way I like to m have a mental model of, of these caches is that you know, a CPU instruction, like add or multiply, typically needs you know, two or three um, pointers to complete. It needs to make two or three memory accesses, like you know, inputs and outputs, um, to complete. And that memory access is, is basically what the CPU tries to cache, right? Now, the memory that you access more, or you know, your temporal locality, is the stuff that you can very easily cache by using a simple LRU-like eviction, right? So you only keep the stuff that you're using most frequently and you evict everything else as it's being less used. Um, gives you temporal locality. But the other locality that, you know, the other dimension, which is space, when optimized for, leads CPUs to start looking ahead and caching data that's contiguous, you know? Arrays, in this case, have a significant win over, over a structure like a map. And, and the most important takeaway for us at the time was that these cache lines, or the ability for the CPU to look ahead and look at you know, contiguous memory, was about 64 bytes on machines that we were working on. And why is this important? Because now you're no longer in percentage land. You're looking at, if you, if you look at just the, the latencies and the way they're growing through, right? If you look at L1 at one nanosecond, L2, the L2 cache is four times as slow at four. The L3 is 40, which is you know, 40 times slower than um, the L1. And main memory is you know, 80 to 100 times slower. And you know, we were doing a, a heck of a lot of uh, these instructions that were making these memory accesses, obviously, right? So the moment you start making these optimizations, we knew that we were going to break through any sort of model that we'd ever conjured in our heads about causal. And to, to truly digest the significance of this, right, we need, to, we need to think back about the time when software just got faster because newer chipsets came out, right? Like Moore's Law has been covering for, for lazy engineers like myself all our lives. You know, you just, just wait for the moment AWS has M1 chipsets provision and, and you're done, right? Like, why do you have to do all this stuff? The challenge here, though, is especially if you're memory bound, is that these chipsets and the newer RAM chipsets that we're seeing have much more throughput, but also a tad bit more latency, which means that, and you know, of course, this, this varies. This is very architecture dependent, right? But broad strokes, if you're not exploiting the ability um, to, to do you know, sequential data access, if you're not really pumping your throughput out of these RAM chipsets, your code is potentially going to get slower with newer RAM technology. And, and this was a very significant uh, sort of paradigm shift for us. And we were super excited about, you know, wanting to get to these baseline numbers in somewhere closer to, to causal land. How do, we, how do we take all of this stuff and very quickly prove um, that this, this makes sense for us to do? And, and what are the gains we can promise you know, sales and marketing, right? Um, and the, the one thing we knew for sure we didn't want to do was, was run this um, on a cloud provision machine. There were a few reasons for this, but one is, especially when it comes to things like the CPU cache, it's important to remember that a cloud provider is you know, cold metal, a bunch more virtualization. Finally, you get some sort of a VM, right? On top of that, you're running Docker. And now you have these containers moving around because of an orchestration service. So especially if you're doing benchmarks on, on those many layers, um, it's very, very hard to, to have you know, n you know, low variance between, between each sample. And two, if we could run something on our Macs, we knew that you know, our iteration velocity would just really, really increase. We could try more algorithms locally. Um, the POC we sort of picked here was you know, very similar to the napkin math model, which is let's take two very large variables, let's do some sort of mathematical operation with them, and, and let's see what we come up with, right? And, and this was the first result. Uh, this was a result that, that no profiler could have told us, right? We went from over six seconds to a little under half a second. And there's a lot happening on this slide um, that I'm going to try and, and take us through. First is notice that um, it's not just a map to array that's changing between these two samples, right? You'll see that there's also a little bit of pointer indirection there. So there's a pointer to cell 88, right, which is a 
it's a pointer chase that's happening every time I look up that address versus in that you know, slice of structs where the structs are just laid contiguously in memory. So there's one lesser sort of memory lookup that I'm having to do there, right? Two is I think the fact that we padded this structure with 80, 80 bytes is, is quite important because the, the original application struct resembled about 80 bytes or so, 88 bytes or so in memory. And we wanted to make sure that we were, we were seeing the you know, close to real world sort of performance when, when we were doing these POCs. Um, the interesting thing and, and potentially a, a question I have for, for you know, Go, Go developers is, is when it comes to struct, um, struct padding, right? So the crazy thing that you start to realize because of how you know, properties and structs are sort of arranged, reordering the, the, the properties in a struct can change the amount of wasted bytes or overall struct size. And, and you know, there's a great blog post you can Google for this called the art of struct padding or the lost art of struct padding. But turns out the Go compiler doesn't actually pad structs for you automatically, which means you will have to reorder those fields yourself to get your structs to be denser. And why this is important, we'll come to in a minute. Primarily because your cache line is 64 bytes. If your struct is really, really large, you're actually losing all of that look ahead anyway, right? What we figured was, if you have 64 bytes, the more the, the float, floats that you fit into there, or the more the booleans, or the more the errors, whatever it is. Typically, in, in the causal evaluation engine, you were only accessing one type at a time, right? But we still encapsulated them as a, as a cell, because that was the concept that helped us represent it better. But if we, if we could exploit that 64-byte cache line every time we were looking at these values, we knew that, that the L1 cache hits would increase significantly. So we split from an array or, or slice of structures to a struct of arrays. So as you can see in this sample, right, we've got constants, errors, you know, each of them are now just a simple array, and each of them could take one cache line by itself. And when they were accessed separately, we knew that the CPU cache would, would, would more often than not have it. Right? The same with, same with the Booleans, right? especially when in, in the case where you have just one Boolean enabled and you have you know, tons of things in your arrays. And there are some non-trivial things that come out of this. I think the first realization you start to have is that when you're using a pointer to reference something in an array, it's essentially 64-bit, so it's eight bytes. Versus if you have an array of, say, 255 or you know, 511 in size, you can use an uint 8 or uint 16, and those are you know, pretty much half the size, right? So even in a structure where you're pointing to other things, it's smarter to use integer indexes instead of using pointers because you're just taking lesser memory to represent that stuff. And the interesting difference in your style of code that emerges because of this is that you're now start to you're now forced to sort of reflect what's happening on that chipset in your application API because you know encapsulation is great and and you know all our APIs were around the business domain that causal existed in, but now we have to start thinking about, all right, what's this, what's this actually doing on the CPU, and how am I going to represent that better to exploit some of these um, you know, memory localities? Um, the, I, I want to impress upon you how different this is from, from how we've always programmed, right? Like, I think the, the word that, that you can Google for probably, or the phrase you can Google for to get more into this is data-oriented programming. And there's some great talks about data-oriented programming. And, and one of the quotes in there that I absolutely adore is, um, he says, remember when you first started programming, you would look back at code you, looked, uh, you wrote six months ago, and you'd go like, this is absolute crap. I can't believe I wrote that. And then after a decade of programming, you came to a point where you know, that, that didn't happen anymore. You would look at code you wrote six months ago, and you'd be like, yeah, I'd pretty much still write it this way. right?" Data-oriented program is, is, where, is what will take you back to that initial state, where, where you look at code you've written you know, six months ago, and you're like, I can't believe I was using hash maps. I can't, I can't believe I was you know, having these massive structs. It makes no sense to me now. So with an L1-optimized cow, we finally got up to somewhere close to 150 million cells. So this was basically, I, I would say, where we are today. And, uh, you know, 
it, it solves a vast majority of the of the use cases that um, you know that have been thrown at Causal over the last uh, couple of months. So this is almost like low key insulting, but <laughs> I, I want to assure you that months of effort went into this stuff. <laughs> but, <laughs> but anyway, uh, when we switched our our chipset on GCP. Um, from Cascade Lake to Ice Lake, our workload sped up by 30 to 50 percent. And why this happened, I, I wish I could tell you. Uh, <laughs> I, I wish I could tell you is like, I mean, I googled about this and I was like, okay, seems like Ice Lake has a slightly larger L1 um, and you know, slightly smaller L2s. But I know for a fact that there's so many of these out there that there's going to be some variation or, uh, or, or other that would actually slow down some applications. The, the, the only thing I can recommend here is, is definitely experiment, and cloud providers tend to, to hide the good stuff. So you want to drill, <laughs> drill deep into your compute engine settings and really figure out what chipset you're on. And in terms of you know, the stuff we've got lined up ahead of us, I think it's uh, uh, an endless world, really, at this point. But the most interesting stuff is, how can we get even more memory bandwidth? So how do we use SIMD? Um, how do we? You know, reduce the total amount of computation we're performing by using something like time series compression, uh, hardware acceleration. You know, if you'll notice, if you remember the the five percent to ten percent, those are things that actually trigger Monte Carlo simulations for for uh, for causal. That's how you figure out these uncertainty intervals, right? Um, we want to we want to actually start doing many more of those. And um, the the other the last interesting bit is is you know if you do want sparse and you still want locality, how do you start to use tiled uh, you know, tiled arrays, how do you start representing smaller chunks of, of local data and, and can get bet, best of both worlds there. And, and if any of this stuff sounds fascinating to you, it, it sure as hell does to me, uh, you know, please apply. <laughs> We're looking for, you know, for great Go engineers all the time. And, and that's our Twitter handle. Uh, feel, free to, feel free to shoot any questions. Um, of course, happy to take questions now as well. <laughs>